Welcome to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and today we have a wonderful friend of the program back with us today, uh, Dr. Don Colbert. He's a graduate from ORU Medical School. Uh, he's been in Central Florida, where he's done his internship and residency at Florida Hospital right here in our backyard, and has been a board certified in family practice well, for more years than we'll tell everyone, right? Okay. For quite, quite a while. Dr. Colbert, thank you so much for being here. Sure, it's great being here. We, we love having you here. And, and um, uh, you know, those of you who may, this may be your first time, Dr. Colbert has such a wonderful reputation of um, wonderful natural and alternative uh, therapies and, and all sorts of different things to, to common ailments that we've seen just remarkable remarkable transformations in people's lives so that has to be satisfying to it you. is extremely satisfying every day i go in especially when i do rechecks like this past week this week in fact i had a fellow that came from dallas texas and last year this time last year his doctor said you have chronic kidney failure it's only going to get worse and eventually you'll need a kidney transplant well he came in his his kidney functions a year ago were creatinine were 1.77 wow. which is impaired we put him on our special program, and we had him lay on the altar the foods that his flesh craves. Right, right. Because the flesh usually craves the very food that invites the disease into the right, body. Right, right. We got him off the big steaks and all the animal protein. Yes. We put him on more living food so that food is his medicine. Right. I just, and he just came in. He had his uh, kidney functions checked in July. There were, the creatinine was down to 1.0. Excellent. From 1.77, and he had it checked again a month ago. And it was 1.0. Wow. It's stable. So there's wonderful. And it's normal. Yeah, wonderful results. Well, I do want to talk specifically because I know this is so prevalent in today's society for lots of reasons. Health, stress, uh, lifestyle, and, and that's heart disease. Yeah. So from a doctor's perspective, just in layman's terms for our viewers, how would you describe what heart disease is? Heart disease is cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer here in America. And it's simply disease of the heart and blood vessels. Now, can, the most common cardiovascular disease of the heart is coronary artery disease, which is plaque buildup in the arteries right. to the heart, which can lead to a heart attack. It can lead to sudden death. There's also vascular disease that's plaque in the arteries. Uh, there's also cardiomyopathies. There's valvular heart disease. But the vast majority of heart disease is due to cardiovascular disease that's due many times to high cholesterol, to high blood pressure, to lifestyle choices, a, a sedentary lifestyle, too much right. stress, not enough sleep, and dietary habits that are inviting the disease into the body. Most people, even Christians unknowingly, invite the disease, cardiovascular disease, into the body right. by consistently failing the food test. And the food right. test is every time you sit down to eat, unfortunately, most Christians, most Americans choose the very inflammatory foods that caused the disease to occur. Because why? The flesh is stupid. I've tell, right. told people for years. The flesh generally craves the very foods that invite the disease right. into the body. That's why one of the main questions I ask on my history form, you see a question on there, what foods do you crave? Now, 90% of the time, you know what that food is? I would only guess to imagine. Sugar. Sugar, yeah. Sugar, <laughs> that's the most yes. common food. Sugar is highly inflammatory. And so many people are eating lots of sugar, saying, oh, it tastes so good. It's my comfort food. It's addictive, it. is it not? I mean, it just promotes more well, desire for oh, it. Oh, my goodness, is it addictive? The studies in rats and mice have shown that sugar is more addictive than cocaine and heroin yeah, yeah. when it comes when, in, in mice and rats. But what happens when you eat lots of sugar over and over, especially sodas and you know that have just concentrated sugar, you're creating inflammation in your body. Right. And 90% of cardiovascular disease, now this is 90%, is due to inflammation. Wow. And that is generally due to the foods we choose. So I tell people, you've got to pass the food test consistently. Now again, I say, you can have a little dessert. You don't need these huge desserts that everyone's right. choosing. Right. On your birthday, for Christmas, for Easter, you know, for your children's birthday a little bit. Yeah. But on occasion, not every meal and not every night. And Some not people think, huge. Yes, this is the huge portion. So right. I and choose, I tell people, choose healthier desserts, like low sugar, dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, not white chocolate. That right. doesn't work. But you know what? Dark chocolate actually is good for the arteries. That's it's what they're good saying, for cardiovascular yes. disease. Also berries. 
Berries are just one of the most amazing desserts, eating all varieties of berries because they have these powerful anthocyanidins that right. also protect the arteries from inflammation. Well, and too, you know, what I've noticed just in my own experience, you know, someone who loved sugar mm -hmm. um, is that with some consistency and over the course of time, that which was so appealing to you um, almost becomes too sweet and the things that you never thought you could pass off as enjoyable in a dessert realm That's right. um, actually are sweet enough, like you said, berries or, right. or different things. And now, it's all good for your heart. Absolutely. These are good, wise food choices because uh, the Word says in Galatians 5.24, those that are Christ, in other words, if you're Christians, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified right. them there. So I ask patients, have you crucified your flesh? <laughs> have you laid on the altar the foods the Holy Spirit has asked you to lay on the altar? Right. Now, some people call me off and say, Dr. Colbert, or talk to my nurses or my front office staff, what do you mean by laying on the altar? Yeah. I said, well, it's taking sugar and it's saying, I'm not going to eat you. I'm going to get it out of the house. I'm going to take out the cookies and the cakes and the yeah. pies and the ice cream out of the right. freezer. And I'm going to remove it from the house and I'm going to commit to the Lord that I'm not going to eat these foods for a season. And then after that season, I'm going to make sure I only eat very small amounts. Right. And for those in layman's terms that are watching us that, you know, uh, may not grasp exactly what we're saying, it's, it's self-control. It's making the best choice for the body you've been given. Oh, absolutely. So that you have that body and its functions yes. for maximum amount of years. Absolutely. And that's one thing, unfortunately, the church has not taught a lot about. They taught a lot about faith and love, but one of the greatest fruits of the Spirit in order to pass the food test is develop the fruit of the Spirit of temperance or self-control. Right, which is hard. And there are nine key fruits. Now, people can't go to their church and say, hey, pastor, pray for me to receive temperance <laughs> or have hands laid on you to receive temperance. It doesn't work that yeah. way. Temperance is a fruit. Fruit yes. of the Spirit is grown by consistently making the right choices. Right not only in our diet, but also in our lifestyle to resist sin and things such as that, but especially in our foods. Yeah. And so if a person cannot resist a cookie or a donut or an Oreo or a piece of cake, then how are they going to resist type 2 diabetes? Right. Or cancer. See, right. cancer's favorite food is sugar, sugar or heart disease or dementia. Do you yeah. realize dementia? We yeah. are having an epidemic of dementia now. Yeah. And it's following the diabetes epidemic. Yeah. So again, we've got, to make, we've got to develop the fruit of the Spirit of temperance and uh, gifts of the Spirit are given. Fruit of the Spirit is grown by consistently making the correct Good food decision. choice. So you've got to pass the food test. Yes. Now and, when it comes, to, I'm, I'm going to jump in. When sure. it comes to heart disease, um, you know, we talked about some of the causes. You know, sometimes it can be a genetic thing. It can sure not. It can. Sometimes it's lifestyle and, 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 and bad choices. Um, statistically, how common is heart disease um, in men versus women? Is there, there a demographic that tends to carry heart disease more? Good question. Men tend to have heart disease at earlier ages. Women have that protective estrogen. Okay. But after they go through the menopause, then their, incre their risk of heart disease goes up uh, almost equal okay. to a man's. But talking about the genetic, there's a few key genetic factors that yes. will affect heart disease. If you have a, a strong family history of heart disease at an early age, we need to check other factors instead of just cholesterol, blood pressure, right. the typical risk factors. We check homocysteine levels, C-reactive protein, and a real important is the LP little a. It's a lipoprotein little a. It runs in families. It's ten times, approximately 10 times more atherogenic or plaque causing than high cholesterol. So if a person has early heart disease in their family, they need to get that test. There's only a very few things that lower it. You know what lowers it better than anything? is niacin. Wow. But again, if people go to the health food store and take niacin, they're going to flush, they're going to itch, and they're going to run to the ER th saying, I'm having an allergic reaction. You got to take a little baby aspirin before taking the yes. niacin. And then you got to eat, take the niacin at the end of a large meal. And then what happens, you avoid the flushing. But we put them on the right dose. We start them slow at a low dose, gradually increase it every week until we get them to a therapeutic dose. And it lowers that LP little a beautifully, wow. as well as homocysteine. Homocysteine is the easiest thing to lower. If you have high homocysteine levels, which by the way, doctors rarely ever check. Check, right. Homocysteine is a very toxic amino acid that causes cardiovascular disease and dementia and osteoporosis. 
it's lowered by a few cents of vitamins a day. Mm -hmm. The B6, the folic acid, the B12, methyl B12, not cyano B12, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. And then a little trimethylglycine, but these only cost pennies a day. Right. But then a lot of people have a genetic mutation, their MTHFR gene, their folic acid gene, so they can't adequately convert folic acid, which is critical for, produce, for uh, overcoming high homocysteine to the active form. Right. So we have to use the active form of folic acid or the MTHF. And it's so simple to do, yet very yeah. few people check very these. Very few people are even checking it. Talk to me a little bit about those watching that um, some of the warning signs and symptoms associated with uh, heart disease, some examples that just in layman's terms, uh, people can be on the lookout for. The first symptom of heart disease that I usually see in men is erectile dysfunction. It is amazing men start developing it usually in their 40s, mid 40s. But uh, picture this, the, the artery that supplies the penis is the size of a cocktail straw. Mm -hmm. The artery that supplies the heart is the size of a regular straw. So the first sign of cardiovascular disease is okay. usually erectile dysfunction or mild impotence. And when a man in their 40s gets that, they need to get checked. Also another sign, there are signs and symptoms. A sign is men and women will develop a diagonal crease in their earlobe. When you have that diagonal crease in your earlobe, there's an 82% chance you've got significant plaque in your arteries. Also, we found that men that are bald have an increased risk of plaque in their arteries. So if a person's bald, has a crease in their ear and has a lot of belly fat and mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction, they are a walking time bomb. They need to be checked. They need to go get an EKG. They may need a stress test. Now, right. symptoms of heart disease, these are scary because many times women have symptoms such as abdominal pain and it's, they're having a heart attack. Right. Even more scary is diabetics have silent heart attacks. They don't feel the pain. Right. And so, again, symptoms of heart attacks classically are a squeezing pain in the chest right over the precordial area, and it feels like an elephant sitting on the chest and they get short of breath. Mm. Or if you're getting short of breath when you climb stairs and you're just more short of breath, go get checked. One thing I've found, shortness of breath is a key symptom. If you're on the treadmill and you're used to going at a heart rate of 130, 140, and you're not short of breath, and all of a sudden you get on there and you're short of breath, that means you've got an artery generally being blocked. And so okay. it's critically important that you get to the ER and be checked and get the appropriate testing. Other symptoms include jaw pain. A lot of women and men that, have jaw right. pain or they have left shoulder pain or right shoulder pain. They go to their orthopedist or their chiropractor. They say, fix my shoulder. And they check their shoulder, it's good. And they start manipulating everything. But typically the heart, when the heart muscle, when the arteries are being constricted and you're not getting adequate blood supply to the heart, it refers the pain to the left shoulder. Ah. And so if you're getting left shoulder pain, it's interesting, the acupuncture point for the coronary arteries is right here. Yes. It's right below lung one. Lung one is right here. The point for the coronary arteries is right below it. So a lot of people come in to see me and they say, I have pain right here and I press it and then I say, oh, that's your coronary, left coronary artery acupuncture point. So I get them down immediately to be checked. I check their right. EKG immediately, and it's amazing how many people we saved over the years amazing. by just knowing these symptoms. Amazing. Well, Dr. Colbert, I know it's one of the uh, uh, top, top, you know, topics that we talk about in health, and I want you to stay right here with us. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back with an equally important topic that I think a little uh, attention is paid to by people. So stay right there, and don't go away. We'll be right back after this short break. Most of us take what we eat for granted, not giving it a second thought. Hi, I'm Dr. Oz. For the three million American children who have food allergies, food is a very serious matter and can even be life-threatening. Potentially fatal reaction can happen unexpectedly, whether in the classroom, on the playground, or in the cafeteria. Until there's a cure, it's crucial we learn how to respect every bite. To learn more, contact FAN at 800-929-4040 or visit foodallergy.org, a public service from FAN. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. Again, I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and today we have a wonderful friend of the show, Dr. Don Colbert, and uh, he is here with Divine Health and Wellness Center, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Well, great. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. And I want to talk about a topic that as we delve more and more into health and wellness and diet, we find out that a lot of our issues stem from food allergies. So, um, and again, layman terms to the average person, which you're so wonderful at doing, 
communicate to our viewers, what is to you a food allergy? Okay, good question. Again, there's food allergies, there's food intolerances, and there's food sensitivities. Right. So food allergies are simply when your body has an immune reaction, an immediate hypersensitivity type 1 reaction to a food, which includes hives, eczema, like for instance my two-year-old grandbaby had uh, eczema for the first year and a half of his life. It was due to dairy. There's, and uh, it's a reaction that occurs within minutes to an hour of eating a food. That's a food allergy. The most common foods that cause food allergies are simply dairy, but usually they grow out of that. Right. Eggs, uh, tree nuts, pecans, almonds, yes. uh, walnuts, cashews, tree nuts, as well as peanuts, as well as soybeans, which are a legume, as well as fish and shellfish and wheat. Those are your eight most common food allergies. Now that's immediate hypersensitivity, generally. But then food intolerance are like lactose intolerance, where you don't have adequate enzymes to digest it. So when you, if a person has a lactose intolerance and they drink milk or eat yogurt, then all of a sudden they don't have enough enzymes, so it goes right through them and they develop bloating, gas, and diarrhea. Mm. And if they can eat just a little bit, they're okay, but if they eat too much, right. oh, they're gonna pay for it. That's an yes. intolerance, just not enough of the lactase enzyme. Okay, then there's food sensitivities. This is what we see the majority of. Food sensitivities are a delayed sensitivity reaction. It's an immune reaction, but it's not an IgE. So it's not recognized by allergist, but it's an immune reaction of the body to a certain food. And it is amazing, the foods that we see. Uh, the most accurate food sensitivity test, and I've been doing this now for 20 something years, food sensitivities, is the ALCAT test. And that test will detect exactly which foods people are sensitive to. But what I've done is I've, by practicing so many years, I can pretty much tell the foods are sensitive to. Right. And so inflammatory foods, such as fried foods, as well as wheat, for certain diseases, like, for example, let me just give you some examples. I just saw a lady last week who was one of New York's finest um, police departments, mm -hmm. NYPD Blue. She was in charge down at 9-11 uh, when the towers collapsed. She was one of the police officers down there. Right. Now, she actually inhaled all of that dust for three months after she was stationed down there. Six to eight months later, she started developing wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, and she had pulmonary function. She started having pulmonary function tests every three to six months. And she developed a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And so she's been seeing doctors and pulmonologists now for almost 15 years with this condition, and she's coughing up massive amounts of yellow green mm -hmm. gook every day and short of breath and on vet nebulizers throughout the day. And so what I did is I always do a dietary history on them. I want to find out what food they crave. The very food she was craving, you know what she was eating? She was eat and drinking, she was drinking massive amounts of milk. Mm. Milk is highly mucus forming, right. as is cheese, as is yogurt, even though yogurt's healthier, as is sour cream, as is ice cream, and all dairy products are highly mucus forming. And not only that, she was eating chocolate chip cookies with the milk oh, wow. throughout the day because she was losing weight and she wanted to keep her weight up. She would have whole milk, chocolate chip cookies. And I said, these are highly mucus forming foods. They're inviting it in your body. So we started her on a program. We started first the diet. We put on an anti-inflammatory diet. Instead of asking for the disease by eating the foods that feed the disease, we put on alkaline-forming, non-mucus-forming foods, which are vegetables, fruits, lean, non-inflammatory meats like wild salmon, right. chicken breast, turkey breast, you know, and, and avoiding the eggs, which are highly mucus-forming too. She is an egg eater too. And by doing this, literally within the week, she was doing better. Then I put her on a special nebulizer, which had n cysteine, which is a wonderful antioxidant. Right. That's wonderful for clearing the mucus out of the lungs, as well as something to clear the infection, which is a special form of silver, activated silver, that kills the uh, viruses and bacteria. And within a week, she was significantly better. So she was actually eating things, A, that were bad for her, but that her body was actually having an allergic reaction to and producing Having a sensitivity, sensitivity. reaction. And yes, another example is like patients with arthritis. I see arthritis patients almost every day. It's amazing how common arthritis is and how it's increasing. As you get older, 
more and more joint pain, especially in the knees and hips and back and neck and ankles and hands. You see it appears, osteoarthritis, what I'm talking right. about, right here on your distal uh, phalanxes in the DIP joints. Well, when I check these patients, invariably, they're eating the very foods that invite osteoarthritis in the body. There are only a few. Dairy's one. The main one is deep fried foods. Oh, goodness. And when people eat deep fried foods like French fries, onion rings, you know, anything deep fried, it's amazing how it affects the joints. Right. As well as excessive polyunsaturated fats, which are found in most salad dressings, cream sauces in restaurants and fast food places, as well as red meat and pork and shellfish. And when people eat a lot of red meat, now they can eat a little bit and they'll be fine. Or lamb, it's amazing how lamb is highly inflammatory for arthritis patients. They can eat a little bit and be okay. Right. But after they eat so much, it's going to inflame them. Right. And especially if you have gout, if you're eating lamb, it's going to flare the gout up amazingly. So we put these together. And then the other food that flares it is people don't understand, but it does for 50% of my osteoarthritis sufferers, it's nightshades. Nightshades are tomatoes, yes. potatoes, peppers, eggplant, and paprika. These foods, for some reason, inflame a lot of my arthritis patients. You, and I tell them, let's find out which is the main one, and then we limit that amount. Right. You know what I ask them? I say, which of the nightshades do you crave? And invariably, the one they crave is it's the, the one, one they have to lay on the altar, yeah. and it's usually the peppers and the tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. Because once they eat so many peppers, and so many tomatoes, it's going to flare it up. Absolutely. So. And, uh, and all of this leads to, like you said, the intolerance, the allergic reactions, the insensitivities. Talk to me a little bit, you know, because it makes sense in one respect. You have somebody who's eaten poorly or made wi uh, not wise choices that have caused their bodies to react or become intolerant or insensitive. But what about uh, allergies as it pertains to children and allergic reactions? Talk to me a little bit uh, about why, the who, the how, does that occur? Well, that, the allergic reactions in children are generally, we call them a triad. They either have asthma, which is reactivity in the airways, or reactive airway disease, eczema, which is allergies of the skin, right. or allergic rhinitis, which is allergies in the nasal passages and all. The most common uh, inhalant or, or allergic rhinitis allergies are dust mite and mold, Animal dander, especially cats, you know, cats are much more allergenic than dogs. Why? Because they lick their fur, yeah. and in their saliva is an enzyme that humans are highly sensitive or allergic to, cause an IgE reaction, as well as your pollens. And right now, we're in the tree pollen, Yes. then we'll go in the summer in the grass pollen, then we'll go in August, September in the, in the weed pollen, the ragweeds. So those are the primary allergies. Those are IgE allergies, immediate hypersensitivity, where you get the runny nose, the itchy eyes, all that. But what's neat is most kids will grow out of that if, again, we get them on the right foods. Right. And the key here is simply minimizing, avoiding, or rotating. This is a key thing, this, the uh, inflammatory foods. Most people eat the same foods every day, yes. only about 15 to 20 different foods a week. That's it. Yeah. If you can learn the art of rotating your food, and this is what I do. I eat a different breakfast four days in a row and I try and get a different lunch and a different dinner. If you eat the same thing for breakfast, the same thing for lunch, the same thing for dinner, and you have the inflammatory foods every day, you're gonna eventually, most likely, develop a food reaction right. or food sensitivity. So simply, variety is the spice of life, and it's critically important to rotate foods to avoid or to get rid of food sensitivities. That is the key, and that's why I talk about that in the books I've written, especially mm. Let Food Be Your Medicine. Right. I go in detail on how to do it. Absolutely, and people don't realize, I think, this day and age, and maybe they're becoming more aware of it um, as it becomes more mainstream to, to talk about it and the doctors to be up on it, is that food that we eat really can produce uh, worse problems than you think within your, your body and within your system, be it allergic reaction, insensitivity, or intolerance. And I think Correct. we're now just tapping into how, if nothing else, how we can make, give you a better quality of living by altering some of the foods you put in your body. Correct. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors are triggering a lot of these food allergies, right. food sensitivities, because unfortunately, most doctors prescribe way too many antibiotics, right. way too many anti-inflammatories. And what these medications do is they alter the microbiology of the GI tract eventually creating uh, increased intestinal permeability and a, a predisposition to developing food allergies and food sensitivities. 
and anti-inflammatories like Advil, ibuprofen, right. Aleve, aspirin, alcohol too will do this. They damage the lining of the gut. So they create inflammation in the gut so that you're more prone to develop food sensitivities and food allergies. Right. Now food sensitivities are much more common than food allergies. Right. Food allergies are not so common in adults, they're more common in children. The good news is most children will grow, grow out, out of those. Of right. And we just mainly have to limit those foods and avoid those foods primarily for about six months at least. Now, if peanut allergy, you got to be real careful. Yes, you do. And because if it, if it causes anaphylaxis, that's, that could cause death. It causes you to stop breathing. Right. So that's why it's important to follow up with your doctor and get that uh, EpiPen or Anakit and carry it with just you. Just to have it with you. Sure. Um, I know in our closing moments, I want to just quickly touch on there's, there are mild and severe allergic reactions we've talked about such as the peanut reaction. It can be a very severe and, and death-related uh, if Absolutely. not caught uh, soon enough. And fish, you know, shellfish. Absolutely. It's amazing how uh, some of the worst food reactions or food allergies is anaphylaxis, but shellfish, fish, tuna fish. Over the years, I've had patients eat tuna fish develop uh, right. an anaphylactic reaction, but it can occur with tree nuts, almonds, cashews, walnuts, pecans, Soy, you know, it's just amazing how the, but they generally occur more in children than right, adults. Right, right. And, and, and it, which just says it's it, important, probably more important that we get our children on the right path right. and eating the right things and becoming more aware of what we put in their body in this very busy world we live in. And Correct. it's easier to put the wrong things in our children. It is. So that later in their life, you know, their body has learned to process in the way it was created to process mm -hmm. and not handle some of the stuff we probably were never supposed to have in the first Correct. place. Correct, and rotating the foods. I think that's pretty Get cool. out of the habit of eating the same food every day right. for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and which so many Americans are so, uh, in such a fast-paced life that they yeah. literally have to stop at fast, they, ha they don't have to, they choose, they choose to. to stop at fast food Easy. restaurants because they don't have time to cook Absolutely. the right foods. Well, I think all the information you've given us today, Dr. Colbert, has been amazing. And, of course, we will have you back and talk on some wonderful other topics. But thank you so much talking about these food allergies and, and ways we can prevent them and ways we can be aware of them. So thanks so much for well, being thank here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And, viewers, I hope today that you've paid close attention and you've learned something new, how you can live healthy and live better. And remember, if we do that, we can just all join hands in uh, and we can spread a little bit of joy in our town in a healthy way. We'll see you again real soon. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telephone dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.